Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We just gave a moment for everyone to join. Thanks again for joining. We will begin very shortly. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. In case you missed it, 2022 was a big year for disputes. Verify is excited to continue our webinar series with today's session led by Gabe McGloin. We will hold a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but please add your questions to the middle module on the right of your screen. You can also download an updated Compelling Evidence 3.0 FAQ from the module on the top right hand of your screen. Over to you, Gabe. Thanks, Peter. So as we all know, uh, because we're part of this group, modern consumers are buying online more than ever, which is great news for merchants. But increased sales can lead to increased customer disputes. These disputes can overwhelm merchants, leading to poor customer experience. To help solve for this, card brands and solution providers have advanced dispute rules and technology to improve the dispute experience and create efficiencies across the payment ecosystem. In 2022, Verify increased global coverage of our products and experienced some record-breaking product performance. Combating first-party misuse, preventing unnecessary disputes, and resolving disputes with refunds has become the cornerstone of chargeback mitigation strategies for merchants worldwide. Our webinar will review how merchants adopt and succeed with these strategies the growth and performance of disputes in 2022, and what lies ahead for the future. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Gabe McGloin from Verify, based in Dublin, Ireland, with responsibility for Verify's merchant and partner business in Europe and Asia Pacific. Now, let me introduce our three amazing speakers, all esteemed and experienced panelists who are all experts in chargebacks and disputes in Visa, Verify, and Google. Hi, everyone. I'm Vivek Das. My team manages Verify's pre-dispute products. Um, I have been in the payments industry for around 17 years now, um, working in areas like merchant processing and dispute management. It is great to be here with you. Hi everyone, my name is Melanie Davis and I work on the Dispute Resolution Management Team here at Visa. My team is responsible for the Visa dispute rules and adjudicating on arbitration and compliance cases. I have around 25 years of experience in the dispute world and it's great to be here with you today. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Hridya Dilapati. I am a product manager at Google. I work on refunds, dispute and fees. So some of the products that we'll be talking about fall perfectly into my area of interest. I work with Verify on their Order Insights, RDR, CDRN, and most recently on the Compelling Evidence products. Happy to be here. So what a great panel. Really looking forward to this discussion. Um, I think we should start with a look back at 2022. Now I know a lot of you are saying we're still in 2022, Gabe. Um, what we refer to here is Visa's financial year 2022, which ended on September 30th. So I know most people are still in their financial year, um, and it's still very much calendar year 2022, although that also seems to be slipping away. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the reason for this look back at 2022. So I think we all know that COVID gave card-based payments a big bump with lots of smaller transactions as we all replaced cash with cards. But Visa still had a 10% growth in payment volume in 2022, um, which is quite incredible. Um, almost 87 million CNP disputes processed. You know, that run rate is now well over 90, uh, 90 million um, based on the last few months. Um, 
Latin America, region with the highest CMP dispute ratio, certainly not picking in Latin, but using it as an example of how we look at region by region, market by market, issuer by issuer, particularly when it comes to things like chargebacks. Um, by comparison, Asia Pacific has the lowest dispute ratio, and again, that's very much based on the merchant profile. They have a lot less uh, digital, high volume, low value transactions than the US and, and Europe do. And we also know that Europe came down, the dispute ratio came down in 2022 because of SEA. So I think we really started to see the, the positive impact of SEA. Um, but of course, there's another side to that story, which we will talk about later. So Heridia, I really want to turn to you first. Everybody's so keen, as always, to hear from Google. Your thoughts, comments on 2022? Yeah, uh, I definitely echo a lot of the areas of concerns you have highlighted. Disputes are an area of focus for Google, um, you know, with uh, rise in payments, which is a good problem to have. And we also have a rise in disputes. Um, so we're definitely looking for ways to um, reduce the number of the disputes that we get, especially in LATAM and EU, uh, where I know we have SEA, uh, which would mean slightly lower disputes, but the fees that we pay if we do receive disputes in these regions are quite high. So we are looking to are looking for ways to <clears throat> bring those disputes down there. Well, I really think you're going to help us bring this to life as we dig into the details with Bebek and Melanie. So looking forward to, to, to more of that very shortly. So in the next few slides, we'll really get into the concepts of pre-dispute um, and the two flavors, uh, prevent and resolve. But first, a quick recap of the KPIs. I think it's, it's fair to say with $351 million in resolved disputes that we really, really now are at critical mass um, for these, these solutions. Um, almost 7 million resolved through RDR and CDRN. 97 and 99%, we are at full tilt for pre-dispute with the issuers globally. That is phenomenal. Um, in the year just past, RDR reached critical mass um, with resolved disputes now in the millions. We added Latin America um, to the RDR network. And obviously this only happened because lots of merchants and partners brought a lot of merchants to participate in this network. Um, as for order insight, we had a huge increase in adoption from merchants, all focusing on customer experience, and all of them looking forward to compelling evidence or CE 3.0 announcement, which we made in June and which we'll talk about very shortly. So, Rebecca, I think this is a great time to bring you into the conversation and give us the high-level overview of RDR and Order Insight. Yeah, definitely, Gabe. Um, so Audit Insight and RDR, um, Rapid Dispute Resolution, are our uh, pre-dispute products. Now, Audit Insight is at the point of dispute origination. And so what it means is that Audit Insight is able to stop a dispute um, even before it becomes a dispute. With Audit Insight, the merchant has the opportunity um, to send what we call enriched purchase information to the issuer. Uh, information like um, what was purchased, item details, when we ask the merchants to pack in as much information about the item as possible, uh, when was it purchased, the date and time, where was it purchased from, the location of the store, the address, etc., cetera, and, and by whom, who was the purchaser, like the customer information, um, their car details, etc. So when this information is sent to the issuer, the issuer is able to have a conversation directly with the cardholder and they're able to um, have the cardholder recognize if it was a legitimate transaction and thereby the cardholder is stopped from going ahead with the dispute. So this is how Order Insight is able to stop the dispute before it becomes a dispute. Now the data can also be sent to the cardholder directly on the device uh, as a digital receipt. The cardholder has access to this data uh, all the time, 24 seven from anywhere in the world. And that increases um, customer experience with the dispute processing, uh, increases the brand value of the merchant, and uh, makes the ecosystem much better. 
So um, this is how Order Insight is able to kind of uh, keep the ecosystem clean. RDR is triggered after the dispute was raised. So even though the dispute is now in the ecosystem, the merchants have another opportunity to resolve the dispute easily and amicably for all the parties. So if the dispute is resolved, um, the cardholder gets an immediate confirmation that the money will be refunded to them. Uh, the issuer gets a quick financial settlement because RDR works uh, very quickly. Um, so the issuer is satisfied. The merchant is able to have the cardholder uh, have a good experience with the processing, so they retain the cardholder. And so everyone is satisfied with this experience. So therefore, uh, through both these products, we are able to stop unnecessary disputes. Uh, it improves customer loyalty and brand value. It protects the merchant from revenue loss, and uh, it reduces uh, the cost for processing disputes. Thanks, Rebecca. I think that really whets the appetite and brings to life what this is. Um, I know that in a few moments' time, you're going to go deeper into the how we do this. Um, so looking forward to that. But I think first, let's remind ourselves of the why. And you did touch on this as well, Rebecca. Um, and here we see that disputes are still rising. So we have talked about how dispute ratio is coming down globally, um, faster in some regions versus others, like Europe and FCA. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is that despite major improvements in the solutions available to merchants to remove unnecessary disputes, to fight third-party fraud, and to combat first-party misuse, disputes continue to rise in absolute terms. Now, e-commerce is growing, um, and thankfully, disputes are growing at a slower rate than e-commerce. So while dispute volumes in absolute terms are increasing, as we've said, the ratio is coming down, so, so that's good news. So this is caused by a number of issues, these dispute volumes continuing to, to increase. Um, as we know, um, there's been global supply chain issues for almost three years now, um, slowing down the delivery of products to customers. This leads to disputes. There's, there's economic hardship, and we're really facing a lot of uncertainty um, economically now. Um, and some consumers could see this as an opportunity to remove some services that they, they pay for. Um, we know that first-party misuse includes customer confusion and familial fraud, but also maybe some buyer's remorse, maybe a little liar buyer. I think generally the way merchants sell to consumers now is so different than it used to be. You know, there's so much, there's, there's contextual selling, um, there's so many platforms and ways um, that we that we buy and we consume, and you know, it, it can get it can get confusing. And there's always the savvy fraudsters. It's always a challenge to stay ahead of them who are constantly challenging and gaming the payment system um, to commit fraud. So early, I think at this point, we would love to hear um, from Google on what you're experiencing um, as it pertains to increases in dispute volumes and the reasons for that. Yeah, definitely agree with um, a lot of the points that you just talked about. I think, uh, as we were previously talking about, growth in payments um, naturally would mean slight growth in disputes as well, although not at the same pace. Um, that's something that we are seeing as well. And uh, in terms of um, friendly fraud, that's always a concern. We want to be able to provide more clarity to everyone um, in the process. Uh, and yeah, fraudsters are very innovative and smart, and while we try to do our best to stay ahead of them, there will always be cases where we miss some, and we want to do right by our customers, even in, the, in those cases. Thanks, Aridi. A great insight. I mean, I think it's probably refreshing for everybody to hear that Google um, has the same challenges with, with fraudsters as, as everybody, um, but I think that's why it's so important that we're all on here collaborating together to to work together to you know get everybody to a better place so really appreciate the the honesty on that one thanks so i as we mentioned at the start of the webinar the the impact that first party misuse or friendly fraud has on a merchant's business is immense um they lose the sales there's a lot of cost generated 
Um, even if they're defending the disputes, it still takes time and money to do that. Um, but I think more critically, you know, the data tells us, the research tells us that 64% of customers will not return to that merchant after a dispute. And given that it's six times more expensive to acquire a new customer than keep an existing customer, dispute management becomes a customer retention strategy. Um, we see here on the screen the, the KPI that 77% of consumers are more likely to return and recommend your brand after a positive post-purchase experience. And a lot of that is driven by first-party misuse. As I mentioned, it's, it's, it's not all maybe liar, buyer, or buyer's remorse. It's a lot of customer confusion. It's a lot of familial fraud. And quite rightly, merchants are calling out friendly fraud as a top three concern from them. So we have to deal with these disputes. So Heridia. Um, we, does this research align with Google's priorities in combating first-party misuse, friendly fraud, and disputes overall? Yeah, definitely agree that uh, dispute management, especially friendly fraud, is, uh, is a top priority and concern for us. Um, even more so than just receiving a dispute, there's certain costs associated with it, like the fees to receive the dispute to represent it. Um, as well as um, the customer lifetime value if we were to um, do something in the dispute process you know, th that hurts the customer. Um, we are very focused on making sure that the customer has the right experience and that we are doing right by them, as well as you know, keeping our costs in mind while we do so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's fantastic to hear. You know, Considering customer lifetime value, um, it's, it's got to be a part of this because, you know, again, you acquire that customer once, you want them to be a customer for life. So it's, it's absolutely the approach, um, and I think a, a lot of merchants can really learn from that idea. So we really appreciate that. So I, I think by now we've arrived at this point of dispute management um, as it should be. Um, so let's get into that and what makes that happen. We've we've talked about the what we're trying to do, but Beck's taken us through that. Um, Heridia and myself have talked about the the why we're doing this. Why is it so important? It's much more about customer retention than it is about costs. Um, but what about the how? Um, as I look at this slide, you know, data transparency and automation, they seem like really good concepts. Um, so, but Beck, we're going to use some data to solve this. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, I mean, um, data is the key for um, delivering business value, right? And we know that the merchants are very focused uh, and they're very smart about storing information about their customers, their purchase behavior, and all of that. Uh, and they use that data to drive their business value, so like customer LTVs and you know things like that. But I think so far the realization that data can also drive uh, value for their dispute processing uh, wasn't there in the market. But I think slowly that is changing, and we see that the merchants are able to now connect their data, the data that they're already storing. Um, there is no incremental lift that they have to do to store additional information. But they realize now that they can connect that data with direct and tangible and immediate benefits for their business. Um, so OI, for example, provides enriched purchase information that stops the dis dispute at the point of origination, like we discussed before. Uh, there's a huge excitement about compelling evidence, which is again a data play. If the merchants are able to provide valid information, um, the liability uh, then shifts from the merchant to the issuer, which is a huge deal uh, in the market right now. Um, growth of RDR, so you've seen uh, tremendous growth of, growth of RDR, which is again a data play. And so all of that um, tells me that uh, merchants understand uh, that they can use that data and automation to resolve disputes quickly and cheaply. So uh, yeah, all across the industry, we see a huge uh, uh, growth of the value of data uh, to resolve disputes, and um, it's very exciting. I'm very positive about the future of, the, of uh, this data. Great insight there, Vivek. It really is all about the data. 
why don't we go to a, a merchant who might know a thing or two about data? Um, Heredia, can you share with the audience today your insights into how Google removes unnecessary disputes and your practices that you've put in place to reduce chargebacks? We tend to think of disputes as more of a funnel or a waterfall. Uh, and the higher up the funnel we can provide clarity to the customer or resolve the issue, the better for everyone involved in the dispute process. For Google, this means providing additional information to customers either on their banking services uh, by additional receipts to their credit card statements or more information to the agents during an in-session dispute process um, through dispute inquiry service. I believe Verify refers to these as order insights. Uh, now with compelling evidence, we're adding another layer to the deflection of these disputes. Um, and if the customer still believes that there's a case after all of this, we also have products like the alerts, um, like RDR, CDRN, uh, to potentially defund them. We really think receiving a charge back and contesting it or representing it should be the last resort. So to reiterate, we think about disputes in a holistic way and try to deflect as many as possible up top. And what we cannot, we refund where it makes sense. And what we don't believe we should refund, we'll represent. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's the funnel concept, Heredia, is fantastic because it really brings to life the fact that it's such a multi-pronged approach and you have to be thinking at every touch point at the top and then the whole way down, let's say the funnel or the waterfall, to be always doing things, you know, to bring the customer on that journey of, of clarity and of clear communication. So great analogy. Um, looking forward to talking more about this. So let's talk a little bit about resolving disputes. And when we say resolving and we talk about resolution, this means with a refund. So the chargeback is avoided with a refund. I think for me the, the, the origin really of this is, is VCR a few years back when Visa said, we've got to reduce this chargeback time frame. It's too long. It takes about 56 days. Um, and a lot of work was done to reduce that to 25 days, I believe, now um, because you know, time is money for everybody. Too much touching, too much cost. Um, RDR is the next level of that. It's literally one second or, or real time. If the merchant has agreed in advance to refund and be enrolled for this product, um, it, it makes it a one second resolution. So um, a great concept. We've just heard real life examples um, from Heredia at Google on how they combat disputes, and we're going to now discuss um, the automation portion of this because we think that's got to be key when you're someone like Google or some of these other really large merchants with such huge volume of disputes, automation's got to be a, a key part of this. But just before we do that, let's consider the history. Um, the purpose of refunding, it's not just to uh, avoid the chargeback. You know, it's, again, improved customer experience. It's removing miscategorized disputes. It's to reduce costs and operational resources, um, and also to control the visa dispute ratio, which is, which is very important. But the key thing here is we only want to refund confirmed pre-disputes. Uh, we've had instances in the past where merchants were refunding based on fraud and dispute notices, such as TC40. Um, it's important to note that in those circumstances, the chargeback may already have happened. So refunding is too late, um, and that means you're going to refund, and you'll be debited that from the acquirer. So you're essentially double refunding. So fraud notices are not disputes. So refunding those is high risk and probably ineffective. So that's what not to do. Um, but back, let's talk about what to do. How does RDR improve the merchant's dispute resolution strategy? Yeah, um, let's talk about how RDR works. Um, so RDR, as you know, provides the merchant uh, an opportunity to set rules, right? Uh, a rule is an instruction on uh, under what conditions will the dispute be accepted um, by RDR on behalf of the merchant. Um, so that's the core of RDR. That's our rule engine. Now, the merchant defines these rules based on their dispute resolution or refunding strategy. Um, so, for example, you could set a rule saying that I will accept a dispute um, if it's under $20. If you know that the cost of processing that dispute will be more than $20, you, you're better off 
accepting the dispute as, in advance so that you don't have to do, invest that money in processing that dispute. So um, that's something that the merchant has to think about and set a rule accordingly. Now, we, uh, they, the merchants can define 10 such rules, and each rule has like seven such conditions. Um, so by that, we are providing enough opportunity and, and flexibility to, to the merchant to define which way, um, what is their dispute management strategy, and they can implement that strategy in RDR through those rules. Uh, when uh, we, um, these rules are set up interactively, right? Our team works with the merchant to set these rules up, um, which is the best possible op you know, uh, option for them, etc. So what we tell them is set the rules that suits suits your business need. Don't take the rules that are already set or there are some prototype rules. Don't use that. Use the rule that is best for you. So for example, if you're a small ticket, high volume merchant, pick your amount threshold carefully uh, and set it such that it, it works for you. Uh, if you have international traffic, for example, you can select which currencies to refund. Or if you know that the specific region of the world is actually giving you more dispute, you are better off actually reviewing the dispute before you refund. So don't accept the disputes if it's coming from a specific region and if it's of a specific ticket size or higher. So use these kind of strategies to uh, make your re uh, refunds work for you. We also tell them that it's important to constantly review how the rules are working for you. Is that in alignment with your uh, business strategy or dispute strategy, uh, so continue to revise it and uh, optimize it. We provide the merchants with the reporting. A daily report goes out with all the transactions that have been accepted or declined. They can use the data for A, uh, for internal reconciliation, for, definitely. And then two, they should be reviewing this data continuously to see if the rules are in alignment what they want the rules to do, what the, the, the refunding strategy. So RDR is a great tool and great automation for the merchants to, uh, to do exactly that. That's fantastic, Rebecca. That's the detail we needed um, for RDR, and hopefully that answers a lot of questions um, that people had. Um, so the, the other major development we had this year was Visa's announcement back in June of compelling evidence 3.0. Um, the rule change that I think really takes dispute prevention to a whole new level. Um, so Heridia, is, is this the holy grail for merchants? They want to keep the money, never get a dispute, keep the customer. Does this deliver? Yeah, absolutely. As uh, mentioned previously, deflecting disputes at the top of the funnel is always priority and compelling evidence is a great tool in our arsenal to do this. Um, what we are even more excited about uh, is that uh, as a part of this, we will also be able to follow the dispute through the flow. So if, if the dispute meets the compelling evidence criteria and gets deflected, great. If it does not, then um, we should receive a chargeback alert through RDR, and we'll be able to make a decision on if we want to refund that dispute. Um, I think the, the fact that this aligns with how we think about disputes on the on Google's side is very exciting. Uh, we're looking forward to onboarding onto this. So I, I love that, Heredia. Um, you and Google have already figured out that prevent, absolutely, but what happens after prevent if it doesn't work um, for some reason? You figured out that the true holy grail is to piece these solutions together and have one flow where it it just cascades. So I love that. Um, that's really where we see this going as well. So Melanie, um, great to have you come into the conversation and give us the all-important overview of Compelling Evidence 3.0 and uh, any updates since it was announced. I sure can. Compelling Evidence 3.0 is being launched to reduce the burden of first-party misuse cases that are initiated by consumers as fraud disputes. Merchants have historically accepted liability for these disputes, often at a significant financial loss to their business. With Compelling Evidence 3.0, merchants who provide qualified transaction data for prior undisputed sales can shift dispute liability to the issuer. Now, I'm going to pretend that you can't see the information on the screen and therefore you're on the edge of your seat, 
trying to understand what qualified merchant data is. So let's dive right into it. For a merchant to receive this protection from illegitimate fraud disputes, they must provide a minimum of two undisputed transactions that were settled on the same card more than 120 calendar days prior to the dispute processing date. And when we say undisputed, we mean a transaction that was not reported as fraud or had a fraud dispute. For this rule, we are not including non-fraud disputes. So we must have two prior undisputed transactions and those prior undisputed transactions and the actual disputed transaction must have the same two core data elements. For these core data elements, you can pick from a list of four. That is IP address, device ID or device fingerprint, customer account or user ID, and shipping address. One of those two data elements must be the device ID or the IP address. These items together, the undisputed transactions, as well as the same data elements, are considered qualified transaction data. Following the announcement of this rule change and our last round of webinars, there have been a number of questions on what is and what is not acceptable for the merchant to provide. In October 2022, we published a VBN that provides additional clarifications. Let's walk through some of them now. Number one, evidence of merchandise delivery or services provided. This new rule change is to show that the cardholder or authorized person participated in the transaction. It is not to demonstrate that the cardholder received the merchandise or services. Therefore, we are not requiring the merchant to provide the signed proof of delivery like we would do for dispute condition 13.1, which is about non-receipt of services or merchandise. Item number two, data elements must match. As previously mentioned, there must be at least two matching data elements between the disputed and the prior, two prior undisputed transactions. As a reminder, that is IP address, device ID, device fingerprint, shipping address, and customer account or logon ID. One of these two data elements must be device ID or IP address. This means that you cannot supply the device ID for one transaction and the device fingerprint for the other. The data elements and the results must be exactly the same in all of the transactions. If any character is different, this rule will not apply. And lastly, item number three, data element clarification. It is essential that data elements are used correctly. For example, shipping address. This is not the, shipping, this is not the billing address and should only be used when the merchant is shipping merchandise to the cardholder or consumer. You must provide the full delivery address. Just supply in city and state will not be permitted. Customer account and login ID. These are the cardholder details or the authorized person details that they use to log into their account or profile with the merchant. Therefore, this option would not be applicable in a guest checkout scenario. Great, Melanie. Um, a lot of detail to that, um, but all absolutely critical. And um, I know that all of that can be accessed through FAQs, VBNs, acquire communication to merchants. There should be no shortage of places everybody can get their hands on that to make sure they're crystal clear. Um, also important to mention, again, that for pre-dispute deflection, uh, merchants will need to integrate to Order Insight. Um, Order Insight um, has been updated to ensure the qualified transaction data can be easily passed from the merchants um, to the issuers. So I, I think from listening to all of this, it's, it's evident that the challenges and the shortcomings of dispute and disputes management has been fully recognized by the payments ecosystem. Um, that it's a challenge that we must fully collaborate on to be able to remedy. Um, over the past few years, Verify has seen a collective momentum from all stakeholders to reduce disputes and create a FARO ecosystem, which is what we all want. Um, car brands are creating rules for previous blind spots, 
CE3.0 is the first step to create a feral ecosystem where cardholder behavior has been unpredictable and challenging for us all. Um, issuers are increasingly seeing value in the data transparency and the automation tools available to them to improve their operations and ultimately the cardholder experience. And as we saw in the data earlier, merchant adoption is growing each year. Heridia, if I can turn back to you, can you help us understand how you see this collective momentum benefiting the dispute ecosystem, specifically with regard to compelling evidence 3.0? How do you think this will play out in reality? Yeah, we think um, compelling evidence is really fundamentally about clarity and providing better information to um, each party in the dispute process. And with um, better data, we'll be able to make more informed decisions. It also gives us merchants um, some more understanding of how um, they're determining dispute wins and losses. Especially for friendly fraud today, we don't really have much insight into how that's determined. So um, this is great new information to have. And I think the most exciting thing about it is that at the scale of the solution, um, it's great that we'll have coverage globally on day one. Thanks, Aridia. You know, it's great when you hear Google saying that the most exciting thing is that we've built out the coverage already. Because, you know, that's not always the case. So great to, uh, to get that plotted from someone like Google. So thanks again, Heredia. Okay, so further evolution is on the horizon. We're not uh, resting on our laurels, any of us. Um, this industry is so fast-paced. Um, change is inevitable. So there's more change coming. You won't be shocked to hear. Um, but, Beck, can you help us all understand the upcoming changes for dispute management in the course of the next year or so? Yeah, you know, Gabe, uh, 2023 is going to be a very exciting year for us. Um, we have got a lot, lot planned for 2023. Uh, first off, uh, we are going to release a new API. We are calling the Verify API in 2023. Um, this is in alignment with our uh, future strategy of being API first. So what we want is all our products to run on API backbone. Um, that will make the products more efficient, it will make them real time, and it will make them performant, which is one of the needs of the industry uh, right now. So we've just released the specs for that API. It's out in the market. People are studying it now. Um, that's got support for um, C3.0 that uh, Mel spoke about. Uh, if the merchants provide valid information, um, to uh, block C3.0 related disputes, um, that's going to be available for the merchants. We have also added support for several industry specific teams um, to help issuers drive transaction recognition um, by the cardholder. So, for example, if there's a ride share company and they, they provide information regarding where uh, was the pickup location, the drop off location, et cetera, um, that hopefully will help the issuer um, to have a conversation with the cardholder to. Um, to, for, the, for, for the cardholder to recognize the transaction and walk away without raising a dispute. Um, we are going to support multi-byte character set. So this will increase our footprint in uh, AP and unlock that volume um, that we are not able to support right now. Um, <clears throat> it's also going to have um, support for eight-digit bins. As you know, that's coming in the industry. So we're going to have support for that as well. So that API will cover all of these supports and more. Um, another big thing in 2023 is going to be RDR Decision API. Um, in, our merchants, our clients that are using RDR have um, told us uh, that while RDR is great, but they would like to have the ability to set the rules themselves um, and manage it internally in their own house. And this API is going to provide the merchants with that ability. So that's going to come in 2023. Um, merchants are also going to be able to receive notifications. So today, the merchants have to go to our portal, download data, uh, or get a report and things like that. With the new API, we are going to send the notifications real time to the merchants, which they can consume and uh, process them internally to reconcile with their CRM or their financials, etc. So that's going to be available. So a whole bunch of information, a whole bunch of additional capability will be delivered um, through that API and uh, through the enhancement that I just talked about. 
We've also seen growth from other regions, and this growth hopefully will continue. We turned on um, Canada um, uh, for RDR. Canada was not uh, able to send us RDR transactions or disputes or fraud notifications in the past, but that they were turned on earlier this year. Uh, we recently turned on um, LSE uh, for RDR again. So we are seeing volume coming through LSE, and we will see more growth like that from other regions of the world. Um, so all in all, 23 will be another great year for us, and I'm really looking forward to it. Wow, Vivek. Um, a great year for sure, but that sounds like an exceptionally busy year. So I hope you get some rest between now and January um, to get ready for that. So now good for you guys. You're doing so much and helping us to, uh, to be able to get out there and, and add more merchants. Um, to these networks, so that's fantastic. Melanie, we've um, continuously stated that CE 3.0 is only the next step to create a fairer dispute ecosystem. What else is on the horizon? Great question. Visa continues to look for opportunities to improve the dispute process for all parties involved. One area of focus is looking at the potential misuse of the dispute process looking at how disputes are initiated and how they are responded to to help reduce unnecessary noise in the ecosystem. As soon as we have worked through the details, you'll be seeing a new publication from us. Thanks, Melanie. Really looking forward to hearing more about all of that. So in summary, um, 2022, we really saw the world return to some sense of kind of pre-pandemic um, I'm sure we're all overly familiar again with the traffic, the school runs, um, although we're all rather pleased not to be doing um, English and math at the kitchen table anymore. Um, but we also saw sales and dispute volumes level off to pre-pandemic levels, still elevated um, as consumers shop more online, but certainly the sharp growth of 2021 leveled out. And I think with something of a shock to the system from dispute volume growth, I think all stakeholders have been catapulted into action to collaborate and remove unnecessary disputes. And as we heard from Bebek and Melanie, 2023 and beyond will see even further evolution and refinement of how merchants, issuers, and all other stakeholders manage disputes and combat first-party misuse and friendly fraud. So on that note, a huge thanks to our panel. Thanks, Bebek. Thanks, Melanie, and in particular, thanks to Heredia for sharing Google's strategy. Um, thanks to you all for listening, um, and now we pass to the Q&A. Vivek, our first question is for you. Um, would there be any other benefits to the merchant by keeping their dispute ratio low? That's a great question. That's a great point. Yes. Um, if, you, if the merchant is able to resolve the dispute before it becomes a dispute, either through order insight or RDR, then essentially the dispute ratio would be protected, which means the cost of processing disputes will be lowered because, and they will not get into Visa's um, monitoring program. So the merchant wins because um, they're able to prevent the dispute from going through and they will definitely lower their cost. Thanks, Vivek. Mel, a question for you. Um, first party uh, chargebacks are a big challenge for the online casino industry. Uh, will the changes coming um, in April make representment easier for this, uh, for this MCC? So these, these rule changes with regards to the liability shift, um, if you are able to provide the relevant data elements, so as we mentioned, IP address, device ID, device fingerprint, shipping address, customer account, login profile, et cetera. Um, if you select, if you're able to pick two of those tra um, items, as well as have the prior undisputed transactions, um, you will able be, sorry, and you can provide that information through Verify, the dispute will be blocked. Um, as long as you've met all the elements of that new rule, 
and you provide that information through Verify, that dispute will be blocked. If um, you are not using or you are unable to supply the information through Verify and therefore the dispute comes through, you will have the opportunity to add that information to the V-Roll questionnaire. It cannot be a supporting documentation, it must be on the V-Roll questionnaire. Um, Visa will validate it and then again the liability will shift to the issuer. Um, if you do not have those data elements, um, you'll continue to use the compelling evidence rules that are there today. Thanks, Mel. Uh, sorry for the, the silence there, guys. Um, another question for you, Mel. Is it possible for a Visa card transaction that doesn't go through VisaNet to be eligible for CE 3.0? So these, um, it will only be applicable to the visa transactions. So that means the items that are going through visa uh, and the visa network. Our rules will only apply in those situations. So um, if it did go through another network, these rules would not necessarily apply. Thanks, Mel. Gabe, I'm going to throw the next question over to you. Um, what's the best way for merchants to avoid double refunding um, for a, this one is specific to returned orders for associated chargebacks? So uh, I, I assume, Peter, the question has been asked here is um, I, I've refunded the customer um, because they contacted me and uh, I was happy to refund the customer. And then I also got a chargeback. Um, I, I think that seems to be the prevalent scenario. Um, whew, the best solution to that is the clearest communication and expectation setting to the customer as to when the refund is going to appear to them. Because I do think the root cause of a, a lot of this confusion is that customers think I should see it the next day, um, but you know it may take a few days for the refund to actually hit their card statement or their bank account. So the clearest communication possible um, around that, if you talk, if merchants talk to their acquirer, the acquirers will help them set expectation around refunds. Something very important to point out here that everybody in the ecosystem, acquirers and also Visa, are doing everything they can to make sure that chargebacks and refunds don't miss each other for the same transaction, don't miss each other. So I, I, I know that many acquirers will block chargebacks where a refund has happened and vice versa. And on the Visa side, V roll will 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 check to see in the uh, in the V roll system functionality that tells the issuer you can't charge this back because it's already been refunded using associated transactions. So everybody's trying to make sure this never happens. I'm not saying it it never never happens. Stuff, you know, there there are you know um, situations where it can happen to do with timing. But I do think the best thing is um, you know set that expectation with the customer. Um, make sure they they're waiting the right amount of time and checking in the right place um, that they're getting their refund. Thanks, Gabe. Vivek, um, I'm going to bring you in here again. Um, does ORDI or just work for fraud disputes, or is it applicable to other chargeback reasons? <clears throat> yeah, so ORDI or works for all chargeback reasons, just not for fraud. Uh, as long as the dispute being raised qualifies for RDR, there are some qualifications. Uh, for a chargeback to become RDR. Um, for example, the issuer has to participate, the, the merchant has to participate. Um, it has got to be a full chargeback, meaning it has got to be a full refund on the order. It cannot be a partial refund. So all of these um, conditions, if they're met, then it becomes an RDR and it flows through the RDR pipe. So any type of chargeback can qualify for this. Thanks, Vivek. And just one quick follow-up question on Ordior. Um, is there a timeline for the new uh, Ordior API? Yeah, so um, it is going to be in 2023. <clears throat> that much we know. We are working through the specifics. 
Uh, we don't have a form date yet. Um, we will come up with a form date very soon. We will announce it in the market like we did for C3.0, but um, um, I can say that this is going to be a 2023 rollout. Thanks, Vivek. Mel, uh, quick question for you here. So with regard to compelling evidence, some of the documents um, can include telephone number as a piece of compelling evidence, um, but some, some cases do not include it. Is that a valid piece of compelling evidence alongside IP address and device ID? So um, there are a couple. Well, one thing I want to clarify is that what I'm talking about here is just general compelling evidence. It has nothing to do with this new remedy. There are a couple of compelling evidence items that include telephone number, um, but there is a whole string of items that need to be included with that as well. So if they're just coming back with device ID and or IP address and telephone number, that doesn't meet any of the compelling evidence items unless there's something else in there that matches or meets the requirements of one of the 17 items, 17 uh, different types of compelling. Thanks, Mel. Um, but back another quick question around the, um, the specs for the Verify APIs. How can folks get their hands on it? <laughs> oh, that's very simple. Um, just contact any of our account executives, um, account representatives in your, uh, that you have, and they will be happy to work with you to send you the spec and uh, clarify if there are any questions. Thanks, Vivek. And I'm going to keep you in the hot seat here. Um, are there any thoughts on expanding CE 3.0 so that key data elements can be provided across multiple merchants? Yeah. So um, this is one of the um, one of the enhancements we have been thinking about. Um, the the version that is going to go out will not have that um, capability. Uh, but we are working through the details with our uh, partners, and we will definitely come up with uh, uh, a, a, like an answer to this. How can the merchants uh, match across different uh, different merchants? So we'll come up with some details in future. Thanks so much, um, Gabe. We've had a lot of a lot of quest, uh, talk about ORDR here today. Can you give? Uh, just a very quick overview of what ORDR is. We've had two questions come in um, about it. Sure thing, Peter. So, um, again, ORDR, Rapid Dispute Resolution, um, it's the resolving of a dispute or avoiding a dispute with a refund. So the merchant is saying, Mr. Issuer, I'm happy that if the cardholder calls and is unhappy uh, with their purchase, um, I'm happy to refund them. Um, and if you press the dispute button, the refund will happen automatically and the cardholder gets their money back and the money's taken off me by my acquirer. So merchants who, there's plenty of merchants who want to use that product. We allow some rules and conditions to be set around amounts. So a merchant might say, I'm happy to allow anything to be refunded under $20, but nothing over $20. We allow them to set that rule. Or I allow, I want, I'm happy to allow a transaction that's, you know, um, under 30 days old, but not over 30 days old. So we give them, um, we give them nine conditions which can be set to allow them to say always refund automatically um, uh, because I'm I'm willing to do that because of the product or service that I sell. Thanks, Gabe. Um, we have two last questions, and both of them are for Melanie. Um, the first one is focused on merchants. Um, how can a merchant win a dispute for recurring transactions? Oh, good question. So um, recurring transactions are merchant-initiated um, transactions. So for subscriptions, um, as long as the transactions are processed as recurring transactions um, and you have the data elements for the initial transaction, the initial transaction being the one that the customer initiated, um, you'll be able to provide that information um, to support your case and shift the liability back to the issuer. Thanks. 
And here's the last one for you. Uh, this comes from an issuer. Uh, what if the previous undisputed transactions were fraud, but not disputed because they were below the threshold? Will filing a fraud advice change the ruling? Perfect. This is a great question. Um, so when, um, and let me clarify as well, when we talk about undisputed transactions, we are talking, um, we're not talking about disputes, let's say consumer disputes or processing error disputes or authorization disputes. We are looking for fraud disputes or fraud reporting. So if you had multiple, tra as an issuer, if you have multiple transactions on that account, but a couple of them are under the threshold, you are still required to report those as fraud, right? The, you, you still need to complete those TC40s, um, even if you don't do the dispute. So Visa will see that and then will not uh, um, include those fraud reported transactions as transactions that the merchant can come back with showing prior undisputed transactions. Um, so when we talk about undisputed, we mean there was not a fraud dispute or a fraud reporting. Thanks so much, Mel. And thanks to all of our speakers for joining us today and also to everyone on the, uh, on the phone and, and uh, dialed in online. We had a lot of questions today, um, so we couldn't get through them all, uh, but we will actually reach out to you directly after the, the presentation. The webinar is going to be made available to view on demand. You should get an email within the next day uh, with access to that. And also, don't forget to download the new FAQ on the top right-hand side of your screen. And also, um, we put together an infographic for you um, to download also. Thanks again for joining. Keep an eye out for our next webinar, which will take place in February. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day.